Nitrogen, oxygen, argon, as we said, make up about 99% of the atmosphere, but they're not greenhouse gases because they do not absorb visible light and they don't absorb infrared light either. They're transparent gases. What's the big greenhouse gas? Actually, most people don't talk about it, but it's water vapor. Water vapor, H2O, it absorbs infrared light. And we remember the earth is about covered with four fifths water. No one is talking about controlling the water in the earth's atmosphere. Okay, in fact, that's not a good idea. <laughs> the next big greenhouse gas turns out to be carbon dioxide, CO2. Now, CO2 is a linear molecule, but it has motions that make it bend. Uh, and, and, and these bending motions or asymmetric vibrations actually abs uh, absorb infrared light. Another greenhouse gas is methane, CH4, the constituent of natural gas. It's actually even a bigger infrared absorber, but there's less of it in the atmosphere. And there's others as shown here on this slide. And here we see the motions that make possible uh, the absorption. This is water vapor um, vibrational motions uh, that we see. It's important for capturing uh, radiation in form of infrared. A greenhouse gas absorbs infrared radiation which creates molecular vibrations. Now we have this twitching, vibrating molecule. It makes collisions with other molecules and it transfers that energy to the surrounding gas or the surrounding environment, then it ultimately ends up in random motion, which we call heat, okay? That's heating. Here is a picture of the CO2 that's being emitted into the atmosphere Okay, as a function of time, year 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, and so forth. Uh, and I look at this, we can talk about an average, but why does it go up and down, up and down? Well, these are the seasons. And indeed has to do with, again, the fact that, that uh, plants use up CO2 and so forth. And this is the atmospheric CO2, this next slide, at the Mauna Loa Observatory. Uh, the oscillations are put in, which are the, which are the seasons, and it's really going up. These are parts per million, about now approaching 390 and, and onwards. Okay. This next slide really tries to give us the variations of uh, deuterium in, the, in Antarctic ice. Uh, which is really a, a, a way of measuring the local temperature uh, and the atmospheric concentration of the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and so forth. And we see as we move really in time close to zero, our time presently, these things are taking off. We're putting in an amazing amount of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, which is going to indeed in cause and lead to global warming. Why do I say that? Well, there's various ways to figure this out and, and this people have tried hard. And if you put in models or take out models, which can consider all the ways of forcings to drive uh, climate simulations, your models clearly show you that you expect the surface temperature to be changing with things like CO2. Now, CO2 itself gets saturated as much as you can use of the infrared lights because you have enough concentration and you pick up parts that aren't saturated such as, um, this sounds more technical, uh, vibrationally excited CO2 which can absorb. These are called hot bands or different isotopes of uh, carbon and oxygen that make up CO2. All this contributes to what's going on. And as it warms up, it of course warms up the water puts more water in the atmosphere. And water, I told you, was the big one <laughs> in terms of uh, greenhouse gas. There's, so there's no getting around that. Uh, and of course, more water uh, leads to um, more extreme weather conditions, um, as unfortunately we've been experiencing. This is the global mean surface temperature anomalies, what you see. And this shows you what happens if you only put in models that don't include man, natural forcing only, 
okay? And what happens if you do include man? And this is the actual observations are in black. The blue are the various models, and there are many of them, but it's only from natural forces. Um, and they don't work. But when you put in what we call anthropogenic, what man does, okay, what the human beings on this earth do, then you really do seem to fit what we're observing. And you have all types of other events that go on. Lowering from Mount Pinatubo and so forth really affects the atmosphere. But by and large, we have global warming. And indeed, it seems pretty obvious, and almost all scientists agree, man is playing an important role in making this happen. So there's a worry about just going on with fossil fuels. There's plenty of fossil fuels, as I'll get to. That's not our problem that we're going to run out of fossil fuels. Our problem is that we're going to cook the earth in a way that's going to be unfortunate for us. Now, different people have had different attitudes about this, and, and I'll, I'll get to that. But I thought first what I should do for you is make a simple estimate of the earth's average temperature, assuming that there's no global warming, as if there were no atmosphere, or that the atmosphere was totally transparent. That's probably a better way to say it than no atmosphere. Okay? But it's the same idea. And first, let's make this estimate. Actually, you can make this estimate. It sounds first like a daunting problem. How would you do this? But you can. Let me show you how. The total power absorbed equals the total power emitted. That's what you expect. You are in you know, steady state in the process. What is the power that you absorb? It's the power per unit area that comes from the sun times the area of the Earth facing the sun. Okay, we'll take the Earth being a sphere. Um, and, of course, it'll face the sun, and uh, we'll take the fraction of, sun, uh, of sunlight being absorbed. Um, there's a technical name to that um, type of thing. Let's work these out. And this will be equal to the power emitted per unit area, how much is re-radiated back out from the Earth, and the total times the total surface area of the Earth. Um, can we really do this calculation? I say yes, we can. Let's look and see. First of all, measurements show us that something like 1.368 kilowatts per square meter is what the sun puts out. Um, and it's not changing that much, as I told you. That's pretty constant. Okay, let's look at the next number. We need pi r squared for the area of the Earth. I don't quite remember what r is. We can figure it out from the diameter of the Earth, but let's not right now. We'll just keep it as pi r squared. That's the circle of the sphere of the sun looking towards the, of the earth looking towards the sun. Then the fraction of sunlight absorbed, that's one minus how much is reflected or what's called the albedo. And that number you can see from space is, and estimate is 0 0.69. And now what does it equal? Well, it equals the radiation of the earth. And I'll remind you, remind you of something called the Stefan Boltzmann equation. It's some number S times the temperature raised to the fourth power. So S is known. I've written out its value on this slide. And T to the fourth. Well, we're going to determine T in a moment. And this then we have to put in the next term, which is the total surface area of earth. And now remembering a sphere and what a surface area is, it's 4 pi r squared. Okay, beautiful. One side equals the other side. The r squareds are on both sides and they cancel out. So do the pi. So we can do this calculation. And, and I did. And it's pretty easy to do. And what do you get? You get 254 degrees Kelvin or minus 19 degrees Celsius. That's minus 3 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's, it's below freezing. So first conclusion I reach is that um, greenhouse gases are good for the earth or, you know, it would be cold all the time. <laughs> and so we want some greenhouse gases. The question is, how much do we want? Well, we don't want too much, as, as we'll get to. Um, but let us go on. But we see now a very simple estimate allows us to understand what is the dynamics that's going on in the earth. We'll return to this and as the possible ways of helping us out later on. Um, this, is the, this is what's happened to the temperature. It's risen in consort, um, concert with CO2. And um, this is a picture of it shown in this slide. This is the temperature anomaly, how much it's, it's gone up. 
and uh, it's take it's taking off and it's only in tenths of a degree but we're when we're worrying about a few degrees uh, centigrade rise because that's going to have a very important effect in terms of the change of the climate in the globe the first person who calculated this is a actually famous Swedish chemist by the name of Svante Arrhenius and uh, around 1900 long ago and he suggested that increased atmospheric CO2 from burning fossil fuel could warm the earth and he made a rough calculation the early calculation of the effect was to double the CO2 concentration, you get something between one and a half and four and a half degrees centigrade increase. Um, and fascinating, uh, living in Sweden, he said he thought global warming would be a good thing. Okay, <laughs> now maybe it is in Sweden, but for most of the people who live on the coasts of various countries and with the sea level rising, it's not a good thing. It's, it actually could be a disaster. And there's other reasons to think about this being a disaster. If you're in high plain country, <laughs> my, my friends in Wyoming don't have to worry about this. So sea level is not going to affect them. But um, lots of my other friends, like in, in, like in um, uh, Bangladesh, it's going to sort of like disappear. That's bad. Of course, people are going to move. They're not going to drown. But, but the, the uh, possibilities are actually rather frightening. And the upheaval will be immense. It'll affect crops, many things.